Let's bring in our guest, Morgan, director of BD at Avalabs. Morgan, Morgan, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. And by the way, that was a perfect pronunciation of my last name. So. Oh, it was? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, all right. I get, like, Jimmy's rough, quite good at that stuff, actually. Where okay. they like miss okay. the middle syllable, but that was great. Okay, cool. I have a last name that often gets butchered. So I, 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 maybe I put a little extra effort into it. Who knows? You know what I mean? Um, two times, right? That's your last name? Yeah, yeah. Kind of tough to pronounce, I know. But um, it's like my full name, I can only, um, I only let people know this on Valentine's Day. So it's kind of a special thing for you guys to be hearing this. But my full legal name is James Valentine's. And that's like, I can only break that out um, on Valentine's Day. So um, kind of a weird, my parents were weirdos. I don't know what to tell you. Um, but Morgan is here with us. We are really excited to have you to talk, uh, on this, on this seasonal, uh, episode of, of in the club. Um, yeah, basically. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, if you could just kind of like give us a little bit of your background, we'd love to just kind of start off with like getting an idea of where people come from and how they got into crypto and how, you know, I'd love to hear how you got involved with Avalabs and, just what's yeah. going on? I feel like you guys have probably seen such like a wide gamut of people that have like entered this space. It's such like a motley crew from so many different like walks of life and industries that I can only imagine like what you guys have seen. Um, so it's been super interesting, just like even in that sense, like meeting so many different types of people who've like entered the space because of their own like personal professional reasons. Um, so, I mean, it's been, it's been an awesome experience so far, but um, in terms of, of my history, I spent 12 years in TradFi at the same bank, which is like infinity in millennial terms. Um, and most of that time was in, um, in, the, in the company's uh, institutional sales and trading business. So was covering different types of institutions like hedge funds, different types of hedge funds, asset managers, and pension funds for uh, their FX and macro needs. So mostly focused on derivatives um, and was working literally in a bank that had 200,000 people. So from an Apple Lab standpoint, this is like the complete opposite in a lot of ways. Right. Um, and then the last two years I was spent as chief of staff for the bank's uh, chief compliance officer. Um, which was <laughs> a very interesting uh, and large kind of learning experience in and of itself. Um, but for a variety of reasons, um, you know, I definitely found myself being more and more drawn to the crypto space, the digital asset space, kind of fell down the, the crypto rabbit hole over the past, I would say, one and a half, two years. And in particular, I think for me, it was really kind of like the smart contract capabilities that really kind of got me excited and wanting to kind of learn more, um, especially coming from a, from a big bank. And I know Firestorm, you have experience with this as well in terms of just like seeing and being in the middle of all of these kind of manual processes and seeing what happens when trades fail and, you know, seeing, you know, the, when, when out trades happen and out trades also in Firestorm, you also know this, out trades never make you money. They all some, always somehow lose money. Um, and so just seeing how and, and recognizing how like smart contracts could fix a lot of that stuff um, really kind of got me excited. And I thought, you know, in, in this capacity from an Apple Labs standpoint, and we can talk about Apple Labs as well, but, you know, in this way, I'm helping to kind of shape that future and pull institutions along as opposed to kind of trying to push from within. And so my remit at Apple Labs is... Um, to kind of lead out our institutional business development efforts and really focused on all different types of financial institutions. So banks, asset managers, hedge funds, private equity funds, and kind of the more crypto native versions of those things and partnering with them um, in a variety of ways, just depending on kind of like where they're at in their crypto blockchain digital asset journeys. And we can kind of talk about like what that looks like. So it's it's a pretty big world. And I think like in crypto, they like to all lump together like the institutions, but it's really, it's really, um, I guess, nuanced to a certain degree. And, uh, and, and it's been, it's been a little over, I guess, seven months now. My timing was really interesting. I joined on May 2nd and like the crypto world blew up May 7th. So that was, cool. <laughs> but uh, it's been, it's been an awesome. The good old Luna. 
Yeah, exactly. So, exactly. Uh, I'm I'm gonna say two things. First of all, for the audience who you know may or may not know this, any actual person at a college, or I I should say, very high percentage of the people out of college that join one of the big banks and actually is able to make it to the tenth year mark. I think the statistic of them becoming what they call lifers is very high, something like 98%. So in that sense, Morgan is extremely unique and like all the power to you. Uh, you know, I find that very powerful because like once you've done something for 10 years in an institution, you obviously know how the institution worked. You're obviously a high performer because not a lot of people survive that period. And you had varied experience. Theoretically, from that point, you could go in any direction and you actually chose to switch to a path that is very different than how you know your institution worked. Okay. I, I I managed to stay in Wall Street for about eleven years, but not at a single institution. I sw I switched a couple times, hoping that you know things would look different, but I, they all look the same. But you know now now we're all here. And uh, you know in, in your honor, by the way, I wore my Midtown uniform just so that you know we have the institutional you know uh, clothing, at least some some resemblance of it. Uh, the second thing I want to say is that Morgan actually holds, in my opinion, the most important job at Avalabs. And, you know, my Avalabs friends will slaughter me. You say that to everyone, probably. No, no, I do not. You can, you can definitely he go back and go, go check the tape. And, and the reason I say this is since 2016, since that previous wave and previous crash, every DGen knows this. We've been saying the institutions are coming, right? And now Morgan is here to make that happen. So I guess, you know, the first thing we kind of wanted to ask is, how's that going? Uh, obviously, I would argue this cycle in terms of adoption and understanding, let's not say adoption, but understanding of the blockchain technology, particularly something as novel and good as Avalanche, was at an all-time high from an institutional perspective. You had the Teslas who actually acquired some cryptos. You had a bunch of these, you know, big institutions that started dipping their toes in water. And I kind of want to uh, get like an overall, you know, score from you, like zero to 10. Where do you think we are in terms of institutional adoption? And if we get a three, I'm quite happy just, just to sort of put that out there as well. Yeah, I think that's a good uh, kind of way to tee it up and question. And I think... The, like before we kind of go into it, it's it's interesting because minus one. <laughs> it's interesting because different than some of the projects that um, you know some of the team has been used to working with, and they're inst used to like instant gratification and instant building. And obviously, a developer is going to just put a smart contract like in three days or whatever it is. I think from an institutional standpoint, and Firestorm, you know this also, just even working at large financial institutions like it takes a really long time for, uh, frankly, to get anything through uh, in general, let alone like adopting new new technology. And so these things are like multi, multi, multi-year long processes. And so part of it from our side is like just like patience and us kind of like becoming trusted advisors to the different types of institutions and really kind of handholding them end to end all throughout the way, whether it's from, you know, just like pure education and awareness initiatives, all the way to helping them in turn, like make the cases internally to their respective teams and like governance committees that like, hey, this is something that we should pursue all the way, you know, to ultimate building on and utilizing the tech. So it's like a very long process. And I think in my time here, you know, I've spent I spent the first you know handful of months meeting a bunch of different institutions and really getting a sense like within the groupings of them, you can still get a sense in talking to them how much they prioritize these efforts, right? And so it's like, yeah, you can think like banks are on like the one side of the spectrum in terms of like they're probably not going to do anything. But even in talking to different banks, you get a sense of like how progressive some of them are than others. And really kind of ho honing in on and focusing on those. And so maybe just taking a step back in terms of like if we said the last cycle, you know, it was dur during the last like crypto winter from an institutional interest standpoint, it ends up being like zero. Now, I would say it's at a four. Four. Wow. That high? Yeah. 
four think, in my mind is crazy high to be honest I think with it's you. high because i think like even just like think take a take stock of the year in terms of yeah. you had a lot of headlines not only with banks doing different like proofs of concept but you had asset managers actually doing stuff in the space to use a technical term um whether it's <laughs> BlackRock or fidelity or kkr or franklin templeton these are like huge multi multi trillion dollar names that aren't just like talking the talk. They've actually done stuff. They've tokenized things. Absolutely. They've been able to access things like, and I've always thought that when the clients of banks start demanding certain processes or certain uh, services from like a custodial trading, trade facilitation, product offering standpoint, like the banks will kind of have to follow. So I think where this is extremely slow moving, but, and I don't know, maybe, maybe three and a half, but like, well, and we'll need a lot of things like regulatory clarity and, you know, so on and so forth. But I, it's not the institutional interest isn't going away. Um, and especially given what's happening from a CFI development standpoint, like I think banks over time and, and institutions over time have realize the need to kind of really start exploring like the, the DeFi space, which is really exciting for us. Yeah. I mean, I, I have a pretty funny story about this. Um, October 2020, when, yeah. uh, you know, Avalanche, you know, had launched, it was becoming popular, all that good stuff. Uh, I was still at my TradFi institution. It's one of the bigger institutions out there filled with extremely smart people and my team particularly was filled with people that were extremely uh, driven. And we would build our own little components, right? But it would still take, you know, a year or two to get it into the hands of the client. And at that time, I was so compelled by what Avalanche offered that, you know, I went to sort of our management and said, hey, let's build a decentralized exchange on a Gen 3 blockchain. I didn't want to say specifically which one, because, you know, if you say something specifically, people will think, yeah, I wanted everybody to arrive at the right conclusion because at the time the metrics were obvious. And, you know, October 2020 was a flop. Like, you know, you know, the, the guys who were running the show, like really large businesses, understood what it was all about. But they didn't exactly see the light in terms of, you know, investing into it. And then come January 2021, initiatives actually got kicked off, even though October 2020, you know, the idea was shut down. Uh, a different initiative, bank-wide initiative to build some infrastructure was actually kicked off, which was, you know, amazing, right? And then every single one of these big banks, I talk about banks mostly because I know banks better. Every single one of these big banks have a very large blockchain-specific team. I still didn't think we would get a four out of 10. And, you know, I want our production to sort of snapshot this time and time. And let's put it, let's put like a picture of Morgan Next to our price chart, I feel like from this moment on, it's probably return of the market now that we're at a four. But like they have very large blockchain teams focusing on evaluating every business line that a bank has, trying to understand what the impact of blockchain and cryptos and all that good stuff is and how the bank can adopt. And those people, at least the, the folks that I knew uh, in the bank that I worked at, super sharp. And they, they do understand both the crypto world and the institutional or TradFi world. So in that yeah. sense, I'm quite hopeful. I think 2016 definitely wasn't the time. People thought institutions were coming because security tokens back then were popular. But now I feel like the information truly has reached the masses and that clients of these big banks are asking for access to these asset classes. And in most cases, you know, uh, financial institutions like Fidelity have the capacity to sort of provide the non-physical exposure to these assets, which I think is going to, you know, make it happen. Uh, yeah. This is why I think your job, uh, I think, is going to be the most important because, you know, we're going to get the word out there, right? You know, obviously, yeah. I care more about Avalanche because I'm a believer in the tech. But in general, like, what do you find uh, to be the most difficult piece of getting an institution on board to improving themselves by using our technology? What do you find, what is the most difficult aspect of it? So maybe just to backtrack and, and, and respond to one of the things that you said also is um, from a security token standpoint, I think, um, I think this is something that started 
gaining a little bit more traction later on in the year. But Avalab's mission has always been to digitize and tokenize the world's assets. And I think that between where we're at from a real world macro rates standpoint and everything that's therefore happened from like a capital outflow standpoint from DeFi generally, and with stable coins not passing back the underlying yield to holders, like I think it just created this perfect storm for an increased focus among not only institutions, but projects and groups to bring real world assets, real yield and real utility on chain. So I'm so intently focused on making Avalanche the chain for real world asset tokenization. Like stay tuned. I'm so excited for like what for what we have working, what, like what we're working on and, and what we'll what we'll be doing next year. But that's something that I feel like is missing. And also uh, kind of the way that we've been able to bridge a lot of our discussions between what, what we're doing from an Avalabs blockchain standpoint and the traditional financial world, where I think they it, it's become more palatable for them in terms of like why and how to tokenize assets and what that means in terms of being able to facilitate buying, selling, lending, borrowing, like financial services activities, that's generally been their like gateway for understanding why and how it might be helpful for them or useful for them. Um, so very intently focused on real world asset tokenization and, and why that is and what that entails and what that enables and all of that kind of good stuff. And frankly, I think more and more assets will become tokenized to the point where we're not calling them real world assets, we're just calling them assets. And we're not calling it DeFi, we're just calling it like finance, because it's just the rails on which these things will now will ultimately run, to be honest. And obviously, like, we're very far away from that. But I, you know, I think, I think the, the nuance is starting to get picked up by traditional institutions that DeFi is not this, only this, like, degen thing happening in the corner among tokens that only exist among themselves. Like, it's a thing that you can actually use to effectuate financial services. Sorry. Exactly. Right. And, and I think I think that, again, you know, just sort of extracting the one thing that really resonates that you just said, the I, I'm not going to call it the average user, the user that is somewhat removed from understanding what finances or what financial services is. The second that they're using this underlying technology without necessarily knowing that this technology is improving their life is when global mass adoption has occurred already. Right. Yeah. And yeah. now that exactly, as you said, now that the institutions are understanding that, hey, maybe there's a better way to store information that should be immutable. Maybe there's a better way to settle assets instantaneously over the weekend, even like I have a couple of friends, uh, you know, who are talking to me like I have a friend who actually has a travel agency business and they have a big issue every weekend. There is some money that needs to come in. It gets initiated, but it never arrives into their bank account mm -hmm. like blockchain. And crypto already solved it. There's nothing additional you need. If you settle with something like USDC, it arrives instantaneously, right? If the credit is tied to that, boom, their business just improved. They can get paid over the yep. weekend. Like yeah. small stuff like that will, I think, creep in to our lives. And, you know, it, it's going to be a marathon. And ex sales folks or current sales folks know this. Uh, it's a slow burn, but it's happening. So, in that sense, uh, we're totally. quite excited. Now, totally. Obviously, institutional subnet is a big initiative by you guys. I don't know if it's right to call it your baby. I don't know whose baby it is, but I obviously talk to you the most about it. Uh, tell our audience a little bit about it. Uh, I think it's one of those unique things that you guys are doing, you know, and, you know, would love to hear about it. Yeah. So I think that um, before I kind of go into, into that work, I think just looking in terms of our pipeline and the target state vision and you got you guys know this obviously being familiar with avalanche like the vision is for there to be many 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 subnets right like thousands of subnets tens of thousands of subnets that are focused on whether a specific application a company a part of a company and so all that's to say is there's going to be many institutional subnets many enterprise subnets um that will you know, interoperate or communicate, you know, in the cases that they need to. Um, and so 
I think when when you're re referencing, you know, our institutional subnet, um, and needs I need to come up with a better name for it. But um, one of the things that I think we're we're working on, and that I'm very excited about, and I think this was announced um, actually before I got here, but I think it was announced at, at, during our summit last um, this past year, but is an basically an environment um, for institutions to come in and participate in on-chain DeFi in a relatively native way and experience, but that's been permissioned at the chain level. So the idea would be you as an institution, whether you're a bank, an asset manager, a hedge fund, a corporate treasury, a FinTech, you can go in and you can get onboarded one time and the whitelist will basically be uh, built into the chain level. And the idea would be for the different applications deployed on the subnet to themselves not have to worry about building in this um, kind of screening, whitelist screening capability into their smart contracts at the application level. And so we really believe that this kind of addresses some of the issues with current iterations of uh, permissioned DeFi applications right now, because all the permissioning happens at the application or at the pool level. And so inherently that fragments liquidity and kind of defeats the whole interoperable composable nature of DeFi. And so by bringing that permissioning down to the subnet level, you're able to, you start to kind of see how that can kind of address a lot of those, a lot of those issues and something that I'm really excited about. Obviously I'm drinking the Kool-Aid, but very excited about this because I think Aren't it's we the all? ability to it's like delicious. address, address this thing, you know? Um, so I think a lot of, and, and we can kind of go into talking about what, like more details on that, but just in general, I think a lot of um, the conversations that we've been having with different institutions and enterprises are opening their eyes up to the idea that, hey, a subnet can give you the best of both, a public permissionless chain and an enterprise blockchain that they're all used to building on. They're all used to building on Hyperledger and R3 and Corda and all that. And it's like, first of all, but that defeats the purpose of blockchain, but also you can get, you can get the assurances and the requirements that you need for your specific use case, whether it's privacy, permission, and compliance, whatever it is in a subnet, but the benefits of a public permissionless chain. And so a lot of, a lot of our work and our discussions have been around like the chains that I'm quote unquote competing with are different than those that like the gaming team is competing with and, and others, because here it's like, you know, it, it's a different, it's a different consideration set. Absolutely. Like th the way I always think about it is use case specific chains, right? And quite honestly, Avalanche only, and only just a couple other ones that allow this level of customization, right? You know, one of the, like, I, I obviously uh, worked with Dex a lot for a little while now. I, I had the, ex like, I had the privilege of going through a lot of the hurdles to get the project up, to get the project funded. There were a lot of things that we had to do. And I'm imagining a world where, for example, a KYC AML subnet that allows, for example, accredited investors to come in, it's by default, the chain itself being compliant with laws, investment laws, securities laws, would allow any project out there to get onboarded and raise capital significantly better at a much lower cost because... You know, every project out there today has to hire very expensive lawyers, has to hire very expensive advice to actually create the appropriate legal structure, then vet their own investors and do all these, you know, do all, go through all these steps that are costly and time consuming. And if you make a mistake, you know, you're in trouble, right? Building that into the fabric of a chain directly would eliminate all of that burden and would simply allow a project to do what they do best, which is building their own product, right? So I view the institutional subnet in the same vein, right? Institutions need a specific framework within which they need to operate because they're more worried about compliance with the laws and you know the regulations of the countries they're in. Hence, if we create that environment for them, boom, now they have a significantly smaller hurdle in getting into this amazing technology that's going to make their and their clients' lives better. Yep. Um, who, and you can, you can say anybody, uh, who do you think would be the perfect match uh, as an institution that you would like to see onboard this type of technology? 
Um, Trick question. <laughs> so there's, there's a, there's, there's a spectrum. I mean, I think so, uh, without giving too much away, um, I think our, you know, we're, we're planning on kind of going about this in phases, right. And you have to crawl before you walk before you run. And I think that it's been about having many, 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 many conversations <laughs> with different <laughs> types of institutions to, uh, identify what is like the social consensus of requirements in order to like induce them or enable them to participate. And in the first iteration, you know, fr from a test net standpoint, I think, you know, the hurdles to participate are obviously lower, but from a main net standpoint, phase one, you know, we're not gonna, I don't think we're gonna, uh, you know, address everyone's, uh, requirements. So it's, figuring out what that social consensus is and then kind of building from there. And I think from our standpoint, you know, in terms of who, who which are the institutions that participate on chain today, a lot of them are more of like the crypto native guys who, uh, sure. you know, are, are able to, are either, are either have a, you know, a, an entity that allows them to do it and or they're trading with their own capital. And so, all that's to say is like, we need those guys, but we also need non-crypto native uh, institutions. So yes. that's, and, and there's a spectrum among them, but, you know, potentially the asset managers or hedge funds that are more nimble, that are trading with their own capital or that are able to kind of allocate their own capital to these efforts, to uh, fintechs, um, different types of like, uh, different types of like fintech lenders. So, you know, it's, again, we're phasing up, um, but, the first kind of cohort is uh, those institutions who are more progressive, who haven't necessarily been participating on chain yet. Um, it's kind of the sweet spot, but I think we're going after them. That's yep. awesome. Yeah, that's, that makes, that makes perfect sense. You know, we as Dexel, as you can imagine, believed that exchanges are, especially with avalanche arriving, you know, central limit order book style exchanges are you know the area that needs to be disrupted asap because of the elimination of the custody aspect because of the creation of the more transparent way of trading rather than trading in a black box and that's kind of how we as a project uh approached uh approached this problem um do we have any questions from the audience, by the way? Yeah, I uh, obviously can. Yeah. Uh, I do see, um, I see Alvaro Martin in here. What's up, Alvaro? Pulsar in the house. Um, we do have a bot that is offering us promotion for our channel. So uh, <laughs> mods, if you could please block him. Um, I think going back to one of the points you guys were touching on earlier, Alvaro said, uh, I think they started speculating much like stock markets. I mean, um, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit speculation, but you know, in reality, behind the scenes, and I, I, I kind of like, look, I, I used to be part of an algorithmic trading team and getting guys to understand algos and then believing they do what they're supposed to do, then trying it out, then actually incorporating it into their full execution cycle was a massive process. OK, sure. and when you talk about algos it's a small evolution in the way that people trade it when you talk about blockchains and when you talk about decentralized money it's a paradigm shift it's not like a small evolution from how it worked to what it is now it's a complete paradigm shift so in that sense you know as morgan says these things take you know not 10 conversations it's probably going to take a thousand conversations which you know uh and this is why uh morgan is doing what she's doing right um I think to that what... also um just in terms of the the speculation i think looking at it from their standpoint whether it's a bank or a hedge fund the lowest hanging fruit is how do we trade these assets right like how do we how do we trade them, especially given where we're at from a bull market standpoint, people had FOMO, they wanted to figure out how to, how to either speculate or enable their clients to do the same. And so banks, I mean, to this day, banks cannot hold crypto. Um, and so some have enabled uh, their clients to trade crypto in a uh, cash settled way. Um, and I think that they're still kind of embarking on ways to figure out how to do that for if and when things, 
really start picking back up from an interest standpoint. But I think, you know, to that point, yeah, that's like the first area where like it makes sense because it's also, it's also an area where if they can offer to their clients, it's an incremental revenue source for them too. Right. So it makes sense in terms of why they're kind of focusing on that area first, because changing the underlying backbone of how your operations work is obviously much a much greater undertaking and so yeah so like i think that makes sense they started to figure out i wanted to figure out ways how to facilitate it as an asset class and then at the same time i think you know are exploring different uh you know proofs of concept and work streams to really explore those other areas i mean every single one of these institutions are you know okay let's take the ones that have hundred thousand or two hundred thousand plus employees as you said right every single one of these companies are at a constant state of migrating from one tech to the other it could be server technology it could be you know programming language you know previous generation programming language being moved off to a new one it could be anything right and really you know it's it's this list that blockchain is trying to get added onto and the only way to do that is if we go out to people and explain to them why this tech helps them like one one example that I always use, right? Every single one of these institutions doesn't have to be financed. They build on server farms. They use data centers. They use actual servers they own in-house if they have serious cybersecurity concerns or whatever that may be, right? The new paradigm actually allows them to simply write the software and let the validators run the infrastructure for them, right? And it could mean millions, it could mean tens of millions of cost savings. One, one thing that I always do when I meet TradFi friends and when they ask me, why should I use this tech instead of a you know, centralized database? I always tell them, it will cut your costs in incredible amounts and it will like, you know, you, you will pass out if you actually did the math, right? Literally, I tell them you'll pass out if you did the math because imagine the scale, thousands of servers running instead you write the software, as long as the blockchain has the appropriate throughput, appropriate finality speed, boom, your servers went away. $50 million saved a year. It's unbelievable numbers. Totally. Anyways, I'm getting carried away because as, <laughs> no. as you can see, I, I chugged a lot more Kool-Aid <laughs> right before I the show. So. At that point, there's still, some of them are still, a lot of them are still trying to get over the hump of like, moving away from a, their own centralized blockchain project to right. the open right. world yeah. and yeah. we're chipping away at that, I think. But I think you, in talking to different institutions, they're increasingly starting to get it about like what that means and why an in-house solution isn't necessarily the right one. Yeah, that's, I, that's guess, <laughs> I guess, uh, I don't know if this is sort of part of your mandate, but the one of the pieces of this puzzle is the regulatory aspect, right? Uh, and I know Gun, you know, in the past had a lot of conversations uh, with, you know, nation level institutions, uh, like how, how frequently are the regulators coming to you guys or you going to the regulators and saying, look, here's a better way to do it. Is that part of the mandate? Or do you think that's one of the phases that's going to happen in the future? How are you guys approaching that part? So I haven't had much um, kind of uh, interactions with regulators on this side. I think most of that like regulatory policy advocacy stuff um, our amazing general counsel um, kind of leads with. And if you haven't met him, his name is Lee Schneider and he's fabulous. Um, I think when I was at my former institution, regulators would come and talk to us and ask us all the time about like, what are we doing? What are, what's the latest? Like, what are our thoughts? And so part of it is also like kind of educating banks increasingly more so, so that they can have educated conversations in turn with the regulators. So it's like, help us help them kind of, kind of thing. And so I know that's actively happening. Um, but separately, I mean, yeah, I think to your point, it, it can't hurt to the extent that we can uh, increasingly kind of um, demonstrate our presence among among regulators. I mean, I've, ha I've had like a handful, um, just depending again on like how they're th thinking about the space. But I think, yeah, I think it can hurt to kind of increasingly have those conversations and then potentially position us to like, you know, be a chain of choice for different proofs of concept, um, either at the 
the, the more of like the central bank level um, and and uh, kind of that gateway to the financial institutional world. So I think it's a little bit of both, but um, uh, definitely scope, I think, to increase that work. Absolutely. I mean, again, it, going back to my previous job, as you said, regulators, I, I was on the trading side. Regulators would actually send us inquiries about why did your alga do this? Show me that what your alga did, what it intended, and what, what, you know, not something bad, right? And we had to produce logs, we had to produce proof of behavior to them and send it to them because when they're looking from the outside in, black box, you know, doing buys and sells in a very rapid fashion, right? You know, the way I kind of always looked at it is blockchain is inherently transparent, right? If you have a KYC AML verified trading blockchain, right? Trading subnets. We can simply build the tools or maybe they can build the tools if they understand the technology well enough to do regulation directly by seeing what's occurring on the chain, right? I think that's the holy grail because I, I, I almost want to say like the regulators and again, the nation level institutions are coming from a little bit behind that they don't yet understand the power of it. You no longer have to trust the word of a large institution you yourself can build the analytics, the tools, and all that good stuff to, you know, go and enforce whatever rules you want to enforce or go ahead and design whatever rules you want to create, right? Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I personally feel until that regulatory aspect, you know, comes and catches up with, you know, uh, the curve, uh, yeah. you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be still slow. We'll go to four, yeah. to four and a half, to five. Oh, no, you know. that's, that's the thing. It's like 4.1, 4.2. But, um, but no, I agree because I think that putting things on chain uh, almost like allows, whether it's an institution or a regulator, well, an institution to more proactively and effectively manage their compliance risk, whether it's AML, KYC, sanctions, uh, what, like whatever it is, um, in a way that's more effective and transparent. So like, I think that, you know, we, we, are very slowly transitioning to a time when I think, every, you know, P banks and regulators thought like, you know, crypto, blockchain, like black market, illicit activity, yeah. all this stuff. And now we're slowly right. like coming to right, the point right. of like, oh, there's transparency. Oh, you can implement all these things and make it better and clearer and more proactive and all of this stuff that like, frankly, I think improves their ways of more proactively and effectively managing their risks. So oh, totally. it's, it's, an, it's an evolution. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I don't know, this has been a definitely a, a big brain episode for me, Morgan, we, we have a thing called big brain time. And uh, whenever, whenever one of these conversations happens on the show, I, I it's, it's kind of like the Grinch, you know, how the Grinch's heart grows uh, uh, 10 sizes too big or whatever. My brain grows 10 sizes There's too big, but you don't, I didn't have to take off my hat today because this has elastic on it. So oh, my okay. head's been growing from all the knowledge you guys have been dropping this whole time. You take it off and it's like expands. <laughs> yeah. It's going to, it's going to, it's going to be ugly. I don't want to do it on camera, but we'll, you know, maybe I'll do, maybe we'll make a, maybe we'll make a YouTube short of it after the show. Um, but I have a couple questions before, before we let you go, Morgan. Um, first of all, you got to come back and talk to us. Was, would that be in the cards? Would you come back to the show? Totally. As long as you play music and next time, maybe we should do like a theme. Um, you know, we can, we can iterate on, on what that looks like. But Morgan yeah, has amazing theme ideas. I just didn't know if we could pull it off, but you know, we, we talked and we said next time we'll definitely be a little bit more prepared and we'll play. We'll, we'll I'm not going to say play. We're going to do certain things that are unusual. Let's say oh that. <laughs> yeah. We're all about the, the strange and unusual here uh, in the club. <laughs> So, um, awesome. yeah, I mean, last week we unboxed a giant, uh, trophy. Okay. My camera, I, I accidentally changed my camera settings and now it is following my face. Sorry, everybody. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> back to my actual questions for you. Um, we did actually talk about this during our sound check. See, so you just did it again. And, um, which very funny chat Morgan, uh, happened upon sound check when, uh, myself and our producer, John, 
were dancing to uh, remixes that I was planning on playing. During Can we show. make a YouTube short out of that? That's what I'd like. I to mean, see. actually, I yeah, we probably could. I think we've got, we've got the footage. So, um, <laughs> uh, so we'll see. Maybe that'll be on YouTube tomorrow. We'll see, you guys. I also want to um, know what is this song, Firestorm, that you requested that was like so crazy. Oh, he requested a very he, he still mixed it. So I don't know if it was crazy enough, but you know, I can send it to you. It's like a, you know, this crazy, I, I think, you know, Jimmy put it best. It starts with like this medieval computer game, like music type like thing. Go rescue and then it, princess, yeah. Yeah. It, it's like this, you know, slowly building up medieval music followed by aggressive dubstep and followed by like crazy beats <laughs> and like a rock song type thing. Right. Right. <laughs> Sorry, Jimmy. Okay, didn't not that sad. Sad. Yeah. yeah, that oh, was are you an insane. Touching the camera? Oh, I thought you were like, yeah. shut up. No, oh my God. <laughs> no, no, that's what I thought too. But then I realized he was just moving his head to get the camera. Listen, Morgan, I'm sorry, need Jimmy. You. My bad. Didn't mean Thank to talk too much, bro. But I need you to stop talking. Thank you. No, um, of course not. No, um, <laughs> just could you stop it? Um, that's very funny. Uh, no, we talked about requests, uh, what you would want to hear um, after the show. And you've already told me we've talked about this. But if you could repeat for the chat your song. I will. I will repeat for the chat. So I was, I wanted, so I, what I was saying was that like, despite the fact that we've been in holiday season, I've heard like very minimal, like holiday and Christmas music. And so I requested a song, which I will tell you, but then I also thought it'd be really cool if you remix like a Trans-Siberian Orchestra song, which I think Whoa. would be hysterical. But I'm gonna, okay. I request, um, I requested the Mariah Carey song that like everyone like loves yeah. to hate. All I want for Christmas is you. That was my request. Yeah. The, one of the great, one of the, I mean, the, probably the best Christmas song ever created probably true yeah. um I, i've been i've been listening to the michael bible version of it for 48 <laughs> hours straight over the over the last two hours look i i i butcher things like i once said minneapolis or something and these Did guys never uh, these guys never let me you know like forget it so well uh, you know people I, I, I gave combine uh, Indianapolis and Minneapolis and say Minneapolis. That's, that's the typical thing. Like I grew up in New York. I didn't grow up in Minneapolis, but I don't have, I don't, but a lot of people from New York, whenever I go home, they'll be like, how's Minneapolis? And I'm like, it's, it's great. And you're so, like, I don't know. Where's that? Yeah, it's like, I don't know. I've never been. It's a place that doesn't <laughs> exist. You're weirdos. Anyways, um, Mariah Carey, all I want for Christmas is you. Uh, that and our guy dad's time just joined the chat. Funny story. Him and I actually DJ a Christmas party here in the Twin Cities uh, just a couple weeks ago. I am just a semi-retired DJ, guys. I still go out and, and move the big circles around. Can we hire you? Yeah, so, so, um, <laughs> so I played that song twice. And Dad's Time can attest to this. He's in the, he's in the chat right now. We played it twice, didn't we, Brian? And those, uh, that was a corporate party. And boy, those people were not, not fun. But we did play that twice, and they had fun when we did that. So we'll, play it. we'll definitely play it for you, Morgan. I got that coming up for you. Um, if you'd like to stick around... Uh, we are going to spin the wheel of PFPs, and I have a very cool Santa costume, Chad, that I'm going to don in just a second. Oh, I, um, I, only for that will I stick around. 